Uh, all right, welcome back, uh, everyone. Let's take up a few questions here. So, Saubhagya is asking, what is posture for prayer? So, a discussion that we had, right? Like, sit or kneel down, so posture. So, more than a physical posture, uh, Saubhagya, it's more about the heart, what we would say, because one could be kneeling down, but their heart could be very far away from God. So it's more about the posture Excuse of your heart than uh, physical posture. If, uh, do you have a question, Shakti? Uh, your voice is not clear, ma'am. It's not clear? Okay, we adjust it. Is it better now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Yeah. So, sure, thank you. Okay, so we've answered that question. Yeah. So that was the main question. And we'll get back to the subject on intimacy. We've been saying that we must have a close relationship with God just the way Jesus had. So what does a prayer relationship, intimate prayer relationship look like? Okay, uh, A few things that we can notice there is when there is true worship in our relationship with God and in prayer, when we are honoring God, we are adoring God, we are worshipping Him, right? There, we have a good relationship with God. And uh, along with that, there's got to be transparency. Transparency. Transparency simply means being honest with God, not trying to hide things from God. We can pretend um, in our relationship with God that everything is fine, I'm okay, or whatever else. But God knows the truth, isn't it? So if in my relationship with God, I am holding some things back or hiding, hiding. I'm not confessing when the Holy Spirit is convicting my heart. I'm not immediately responding to that. There will be a distance. It's very similar to any other healthy relationship. You know, if you withhold information in a relationship, obviously there'll, there'll be issues, there'll be problems. And similarly, in our relationship with God, we need transparency or honesty. And that makes for a close relationship. Close relationship is also listening, God's voice. So how, how do we uh, become very familiar with God's voice? The simple answer is practice. Okay, practice. I know these days we have uh, cell phones, but in my days, okay, uh, just kidding, we used to have these landlines where you have to uh, pick up the phone and you'll not even see a number on that landline. It'll just be like you just pick up the call. But there used to be certain people like you know, our friends or our uh, relatives, the moment you pick up the phone and they say hello, you're like, oh, hi, how are you? And you just go straight to talking. You don't even ask who you are, what is your name? Because the voice is familiar. They've been calling us every day, every other day. We know who it is. You know, it's our uncle, it's our sibling, it's whoever, some known person, a friend. But how did we know their voice? Familiarity. The sheep hear my voice. The sheep know my voice. John 10 verse 3. So we keep saying, how, how do I know it's God? How can I tell it's God? Is, is it really from God? Intimacy. The more time we are spending with God, the more of God's voice that we are hearing, the moment God speaks, I know that I know that I know. God said it. 
people may ask how do you know we can't explain it completely but we know so this is how we begin to understand and recognize god's voice you know we are spending time with god and we become familiar uh, with how god speaks and then of course you know intimacy also means uh, waiting in his presence abiding in his presence soaking in his presence that means we take time to be with god okay intentionally we'll come to all this later on uh, but we have to do this if we want a strong relationship with god we can't just be so busy in fact being busy is one of the killers of our relationship with god yeah we need to do a lot of work we need to serve the lord uh, because he has called us to but even when we are serving him we can still make time to spend with the lord so that is where we are going that's what we want to develop in our lives okay so all these things uh, spending time with god having an honest relationship with god listening from god and also taking time to just be in his presence you know sometimes we may not want to um pray and ask god for something you just want to be in his presence right we may put on some worship music and just be in his presence wait in his presence uh, these are all things that will strengthen or the mic went on mute pastor okay uh, i i need help to set the mic it's going on are you able to hear me now yeah pastor and also the quality of the voice is also going down whenever the mic is muted and unmuted the quality okay, we we'll, we we'll look into it right okay? just a moment yeah sure pastor
yes, hopefully, online students, can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Yes, it's clear now, Pastor. Yeah, sure. Okay. Fine. So um, we we were just recapping some of the points regarding an intimate relationship, and uh, I moved on to the consequences or the results of intimacy. And we said that one is to know God's heart. If we are close to God, it's easier to know what God wants. And second is fruitfulness. If we go by John chapter 15, we know that it's the branch which is in the vine that can bear fruit. So my life can bear fruit for God's glory, for his kingdom, when I am close to God. All right. Now, what are some of the hindrances or things which will stop our intimate relationship with God in prayer? We know it's, it's it needed to be close to God. But what are some things that can uh, prevent our intimacy or interfere with our intimacy? Busyness, okay, that's true. Yeah, busy. We are so busy. Yeah. Laziness, okay, true. Okay, we idolize something else. Yeah. Lack of practice, yeah, that could be. Yes, attitudes of our hearts, unforgiveness, a posture of unforgiveness. Mobile phone, yeah, true. It's a, any distraction for that matter. And obviously, I think for our generation, the mobile phone is a big hindrance. Okay, so you can put it away when you're spending time in prayer. Anything else? Overthinking, correct, overthinking. Uh, and in our notes, there's also a point on sin consciousness. Okay, sin consciousness. What is that? It's a mindset where we are not focusing on what Jesus has done. We are focusing more on our lack, our sin, our failures. So when we come into God's presence, we may come in saying, God, I'm not worthy. God, you know, um, uh, why would you listen to my prayer? Or I'm such a sinful person. Something like that. Whenever we are so sin conscious, we have not fully understood who we are in Christ. What does the Bible say? We are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What does the scripture say? God accepts us in the beloved. That means every time I approach God in prayer, how is God looking at me? God loves me in his presence because of Jesus or through Jesus, I am now accepted. So the Bible says in Hebrews 4, come with boldness, come with boldness into God's presence. That's how you and I should come into God's presence. I can boldly come because he is my father and I can just walk into his presence. That's the way, you know, I can approach him boldly and experience of all that he has to offer me. But when I'm sin conscious, when I'm not fully understanding of the redemptive work that Jesus did on the cross, it keeps me away. I'm always thinking, God is not listening. God is not accepting. God doesn't like, like me. So many things. Right? Satan is doing that to us. He's constantly accusing us and putting us down in our minds. And we are in agreement to that. And we are saying, yeah, actually I'm like that. And that doesn't help for us to develop a strong relationship with God. You know, sometimes many of us are in that place. We carry guilt, shame, um, and our, our mind is sort of uh, bombarded by Satan and his lies. And we are not freely able to pray with confidence of faith. And it stops us, stops us from receiving answers and also 
deepening our relationship with god so we need to overcome this burden that satan puts on us guilt shame covering us keeping us away from the presence of god we know that the holy spirit convicts us of the wrong things so if there's anything the holy spirit is convicting us about we must repent of it immediately repent and say god that's not correct what i did i said or my attitude um i repent and i will not do that again turn away from it right and come back into a strong relationship with god so sin consciousness will also keep us out of a close relationship with god then of course all the things that um, we have discussed here um you know we said laziness or lack of discipline we'll realize that having a strong prayer life requires discipline what is discipline ha huh? obedience okay boot camp okay <laughs> yeah i know what we are experiencing right now so what is discipline in simple words discipline is when uh, we have developed developed an ability and incorporated good habits into our lives and our lifestyle now take for example brushing okay when we were all kids we hated it you know some kids just run away they're like no i don't want to brush my teeth but the parents are like no you have to it's good for you it's good for your health right so they start off like that and the parents have to teach them it's a difficult habit they are struggling to develop the good habit but as they do it every day what happens we come to a place where we don't even think about it we don't put it in our to do list anybody do we put it in our to do list that i have to brush no we don't it's part of my lifestyle was it easy to get here no in the beginning it was difficult but now there's discipline you overcome that initial struggle of putting that into your everyday life and then now it's kind of cruise control it just happens right so in the same way when it comes to prayer all of us struggle to make time to focus to sit in god's presence we struggle because we are distracted we are thinking about work we are thinking about many things but we need to discipline ourselves slowly we tell ourselves no i have to do this i have to do this this has to be done and every day we are doing it the habit is being developed little by little little by little little by little till we come to a place where the struggle is not that much anymore very easily i can just come into god's presence i can focus i can pray but it's adding value to my spiritual life it's adding value to my life in general now that i have a prayer habit or a prayer discipline got it so that is what discipline is developing good habits into our lifestyle it's not going to be easy it's a struggle in the beginning but if we keep doing it eventually it becomes a part of our lives so discipline many of us uh, <clears throat> you know um uh, someone said that great aspirations fail due to lack of discipline we want to do great things like imagine you know i want to be a a great uh, instrumentalist i want to be a great concert pianist go and ask that person who's playing in the concert how many hours have you practiced how many years have you practiced he may say something like my entire life right so to get to that place he's put in that kind of discipline and hard work now we may want to do many things but without the discipline we are never going to get there it's going to take discipline it's going to take hard work it's going to take that kind of focus and you and i have to train that's why we say training we have to train ourselves uh even like a soldier so that uh we get into those habits and they will stay with us for the rest of our lives and we'll be so grateful that we struggled now because it's going to be useful it's going to be 
beneficial. So prayer, discipline. Without discipline, it's going to be difficult to have a strong prayer life and an intimate relationship, consistent relationship with God. Yeah, then the different things that we spoke about. Let's come to the redemptive heart of God. So we said to pray in the right way, we need to understand God's nature, have intimacy. Third is knowing the redemptive heart of God. What, what does it stand for? In the Old Testament, there are ways in which God dealt with his people where he redeemed them. Redemption means buying someone out of slavery. So imagine there's a slave and the life is very difficult for a slave. They don't have, uh, you know, uh, they can't do what they want to do. They are doing everything what the master tells them to do. It's a difficult life. But we want to make this slave free. What to do? Somebody has to come and pay the price for the freedom of the slave. That's when they are called redeemed or they are free. In the Old Testament, God gave laws um, under you know, Moses where he told him at certain times, slaves could be set free in these ways, like if, you know, the price is paid or there was something known as the year of Jubilee, you know, a, a particular year when all the slaves will be set free. So what does it tell us? It tells us that God always thought about redemption. He never wanted people to be in slavery. So he made a provision for people to be redeemed. In the book of Ruth, we uh, talk about Ruth, whose life was so difficult and she did not even have a future. But we later on read about a man called as Boaz, who comes and who becomes her kinsman redeemer. So from having no future to having a great future. You know, she goes from having no future to having a great future. Why? Because there was a redeemer called Boaz. And Boaz is that picture of Christ in our lives. From having nothing to having the life and the promises of God through Jesus Christ. So what redemption means is God wants to take us from nothing to abundance. He wants to take us from destruction to, you know, his perfection. If there is anything that is broken, anything that is damaged, anything that is not working, in God's nature, there's always redemption. You know, I like to say it like this. If you ever bring God something that is broken, he can't help it but fix it. Right? Because he can and he wants to. So God is a redeeming God. He doesn't like to let things be destroyed. He doesn't like to see people in slavery. He always wants a good future. He always wants the best for people. That's the redemptive heart of God. Even if you know someone's life is stuck, and we see many such examples in scripture, people uh, you know, who, who don't have anything, like you see David, shepherd boy, suddenly he's a king. How can all this happen? Because our God has a redemptive heart. He does the unusual. He does the miraculous in people's lives. Know that God is redemptive. Even if someone has gone far away from God, what is God's heart for that person? redemptive. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 says, God saves to the uttermost. You know, the greatest sinner, the greatest sin. If there is repentance, God can redeem a life that's gone so far away from him too. It's possible. 
God can do it. It's not difficult for God. That's what the redemptive heart of God is. Now, why are we talking about God's redeeming nature? Where he will not let anything be destroyed. Reason is, when we pray, we must pray with a redeeming heart. So how to pray with a redeeming heart? Imagine, there's a young person in a home who's far away from God, who's wasting their lives and all kinds of bad habits, you know, who's not responding to God. And, um, you know, they are making their own life difficult. How to pray for a young person like that? We may want to pray consequences. We say, God, look at him. He doesn't listen. He's disobedient. He's rebellious. Let him not get a job. Let him not have a good life. You know, let him be... Let him live like a vagabond, like the prodigal son. We can pray prayers like that, but it will clash with the redemptive heart of God. Because we know that by nature, God is redemptive. So when there's a problem in this person's life, the right way to pray is, God, we know he's far away from you, yet you are a redeemer. You are a restorer. No, you are a God who has changed lives. Bring him to a turning point. Redeem his life, O oh God. Change his life, O oh God. Make him a new person, O oh God. That prayer is a prayer prayed with the redemptive heart of God. Imagine, you know, we hear about some of our friends or family members, their marriage. There are issues in their marriage. You know, the couple are fighting, different things are going on. And the moment we hear about all this, if we pray and say, okay, let it not work out. That's what we are praying. But then we're clashing with the redemptive heart of God. How do I pray with God's redemptive heart? God's redemptive heart helps us pray that God, whatever the problem, whatever the strife, whatever the miscommunication, whatever the misunderstanding, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will uproot those things, oh God that you will strengthen the relationship of this couple, that you will restore this marriage, restoration, redemption, bringing them back into the plan of God, bringing them back into the purpose of God. That is praying with a redemptive heart. So there's nothing so damaged that God cannot restore. So whenever we come to God, having a hope that, yes, God, you will redeem this person's life or this family. We can pray like that. And that is a correct prayer every time. right? So that is how we pray with a redemptive heart. So don't give up. Basically, uh, trust God that whatever is lost can be recovered. You know, sometimes there are people, they say, I've wasted many years of my life. How can God use me? Don't worry. Think about Apostle Paul. He was a persecutor. He was away from God. But didn't God work through him? Yes, God did. Time is gone. That's not a problem for God. He restores time. Amen? So a redemptive heart, when we as the praying people carry a redemptive heart, we will not look at the problem and say, it's the end. Instead, we'll say, God, you come into this dead situation. You can still breathe life into the deadness. You can um, cause this dryness to turn into flourishing. Where there is mourning, there can be dancing. Right? So that is how we pray with a redemptive heart. When we look at people, when we look at people's situations, their conditions, God can still do something. There is no dead situation for God because he breathes life even into the dead things. So that's how we must be when we pray. Don't give up. Basically, bottom line, don't give up. Speak God's hope into the difficult situation. Okay, so that is praying with a redemptive heart. Any questions, any thoughts about that?
All right. Um, we'll proceed then. Apart from these things, what else is going to help us pray in the correct way? Knowing the promises of God. We must depend on the promises of God and pray them through. So there are many, many promises. Even when we study um, how to pray for our family, how to pray for the believers, we will come to scriptures. There are scriptures that we can take and you know we can declare them. Uh, maybe a simple one is God gives us wisdom. Okay, James chapter 1, verse 5. It says, If anyone lacks wisdom, then let him ask God. God who gives uh, you know generously to all will give it to him, but he should not doubt in his heart, because if he does, then he will be like a uh, you know a wave tossed around. So basically, that scripture says if we ask God by faith for wisdom, he will give us. So I stand on that promise. Whenever I pray for wisdom, I pray believing. I'm asking God for wisdom. God will give me wisdom. So you're praying the promise. And that's a powerful way to pray. Always pray standing on scripture. Standing on the promises of God. That's powerful. Uh, I heard uh, one uh, particular uh, pastor. Whenever people used to come to him and say, Pastor, I have a prayer request. Uh, and this is my prayer request. He would ask them the question, okay, you want God to do this for you, but based on which scriptures? Right? What are the scriptures that you're holding on to? And they would say, I'm not holding on to anything. Right? No scriptures. Then he would say, look, if you're not holding on to scripture, then how can God do that for you? Because you're not coming on the basis of God's promise. Right? So it's important. If I'm asking God for healing, I can base it on the promises of God and say, God, you said, Exodus 15, 26, you said, Lord, that I am the God who heals you. You are Jehovah Rapha. Lord, you said, not that God has forgotten, but I am saying that my foundation is what God said. You said you're my healer, so I'm saying you're my healer. I want healing in my body. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. I'm standing on the word. This is what scripture says. And so I pray on based on the promises of God. So I want to ask us a question today. Do we have certain promises that we have taken from the Bible? And uh, have we written it down? If you haven't, then that's a good exercise to do. Pull out scriptures regarding whatever it is that you know you want, maybe success or um, uh, wisdom, understanding, or blessing upon your family, upon your ministry. Write down scriptures. And when you pray, pray based on the scriptures. So pray based on promises of God. The next is partnering with the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit, He is called as the Spirit of supplication. Okay, supplication is nothing but earnestly asking God and we'll talk more about it later. But remember this, Holy Spirit is a, he is a spirit who helps us in our prayer. He gives us the grace to pray. So there are times when we pray and we may say that I don't feel like I have what it takes to keep praying. Okay, I begin to pray and then I feel weary. I stop. What to do? Very simple. Ask the Holy Spirit. You can say, Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of grace and supplication. Zechariah 12.10. Help me. Help me in my praying. God, I'm not able to pray. Please help me. You know, some of us, when we are developing the prayer habit, uh, maybe we may decide, okay, I'm going to pray for one hour. Right? And you start praying. You look at the clock. Only five minutes gone. You still have 55 minutes to pray for. And you're thinking, what will I do now? I have to still pray for 55 minutes and I don't have any prayer points. Ask the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, I want to pray. 
help me. He is the spirit of grace and supplication. He will help us when we want to pray. And God has also given us the ability to pray in tongues or prayer in the spirit. Romans chapter 8 verses 26 and 27. When we don't know what to pray. You know, there are times when we don't know what to pray. I don't know if it has ever happened to you. But it has happened to me. There are times when I'm so confused. I'm like, I don't know what to pray for. What is the best way to pray then? Just pray in tongues. Because Holy Spirit gives you the utterance. As the Spirit gives utterance. We see that in Acts chapter 2. They all spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. So we start to pray in the language that the Holy Spirit gives us. Now, why should I do that? Simply because we learn later that the prayer in the Spirit is perfect prayer. Whatever we pray, it's from the Holy Spirit. And can the Holy Spirit pray error at any point? Never, because He's God. He can never pray anything which is not in the will of God. So, I can boldly just start praying in tongues when I don't know what to pray in my language. And, you know, that, that's something to experience and see how powerful it is. So we must pray in our language, but also make use of the ability to pray in the spirit. And that will strengthen us to have a powerful prayer life. So pray partnering with the Holy Spirit. As much as we said we need to know the nature of God, we should also understand who we are, our position in Christ. Now you have an entire course on identity. Knowing my identity will also help me have a powerful prayer life. So as I said earlier, sometimes we go into God's presence. And sorry, we have a feeling that God doesn't accept us. <coughs> but when we know that we are a child of God, is there a greater faith to receive? <coughs> what do you think? Yeah? Of course. So, <coughs> this example in prayer is when you go to God as a child, right? And any child who just goes straight to their parents and be willing to ask even for very uh, difficult or expensive things. Why? Because there is a boldness. They have the understanding that I am uh, a daughter or a son of my parents and my parents will even if they don't give it they will at least listen and they will not be condemning of me now for many of us as believers in this area of identity we struggle a lot a lot we know who god is but who am i let's take for example i am forgiven my identity is in christ is i am forgiven. But when I go into God's presence, if I've done something that has not pleased God's heart, and I continue to say, no, God doesn't forgive me. God doesn't forgive me. It becomes very difficult for me to believe that God will answer my prayer. Because I'm still holding on to the fact that I am not forgiven. Okay? It affects it affects my prayer life. Or how about this? If I believe I am not blessed, everyone else is blessed, my friends are blessed, you know, my teachers are blessed, I'm not blessed. I don't know why when I pray, God doesn't listen to me. God listens to everyone else. Because in my head, I've not believed the word of God that says I am already blessed. 
right so the, there's a problem there's a problem with my identity i cannot see myself as forgiven i cannot see myself as a child of god i cannot see myself as blessed i cannot you know see myself as many other things that have changed the bible says when we are in christ when i am in christ i am a new creation maybe my past life was really terrible but even now my identity is that old person who i was and so lacking confidence in my relationship with god identity is very important if i am not renewed in my mind to the truth that now i am changed i am a new creation in christ my prayer life will not be effective you know my prayer life will um i mean there'll be no success in my prayer life so we have to work on our identity work on our identity how to work on it meditate meditate on what the word says who you have become who we are in christ is who we truly are now satan will come with all kinds of lies he'll say uh god doesn't accept you god doesn't love you god doesn't care god doesn't listen god prefers others over you all that is a lie it's not there in the word and so when i reject these things i can boldly come into god's presence you know there's a freedom that you and i will experience in our prayer and it's beautiful to come to that place and i'm sharing because i went through my own journey of uh, feeling accepted by god okay it was all in my head that i was not able to settle it that god is actually listening to everything and god is accepting of me but when that breakthrough happened it was so different i could sense i could sense that now i can go boldly into god's presence and pray i not feel you know that that uh, shame or guilt or heaviness or a feeling like god is here but there's a wall between god and me right but it's a matter of knowing my identity we've got to work on it work hard on it and meditate on those scriptures and as we do that slowly the shift will come in our believing and when we believe right we will experience uh, you know the good things and the abundance that god has for us so identity our position in christ finally a life of surrender so god wants us to depend completely on him and a strong prayer life is a life when we have surrendered to god so yes we are praying we may bring our request to god but ultimately our heart has to be surrendered to say god it's not about my will it's about your will in my life it's about your purpose in my life so to always check our hearts what is my prayer life about only getting what i want is that what my prayer life is about and is that what i'm building my prayer life towards see everything we want may not be god's best choice for us so you and i must be willing to lay down our choices for god's best that's what we call surrender when we say god i give it all to you you know how to lead me in the right way this is what i want but i am surrendered i'm surrendered wholly to you my whole life is is yours you do what you have purposed right so a life of surrender is also um you know we need to be in that place of surrender for us to experience victory in our prayer life okay so i'm just going to stop with this there are seven positions that we covered we said we must understand god's nature be intimate with god understand god's redemptive heart know his promises 
partner with the Holy Spirit, know our position in Christ and also surrender our lives to God. And that's where there will be a strength and power in prayer. So let me just stop here. Uh, if there are questions, we can take them up. Okay, so we could probably just go back and uh, study through uh, our notes. There are many scriptures given here. We do not read everything. So you can spend time reading each one of them as well. And uh, if you still have any questions after that, we can take it up during the class. All right, so if there's nothing, we can um, wrap up right away. So let's close. Uh, and I want to request uh, one of our online students to please pray. Could you kindly unmute and pray? Thank you, our Father. We worship you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for today's whatever we are learning, our God Master. Lord, thank you, Holy Spirit, you are our teacher, God Master. Lord, thank you for this ma'am, our God Master. Thank you for all the ma'am and teacher, uh, teacher, God Master, pastors, our God Master, those who are teaching us, our God Master. Lord, I pray, Lord Master, we pray for heavenly wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Holy Spirit, we pray for your spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Help us, our God Master, whatever we learn, our God Master. Lord, we thank you and we praise you, God Master. Lord, touch our memory, God Master. Touch our memory, God Master. Lord, touch our mind, our God Master. Master. Lord, we thank you, Lord Master. Lord, we worship you, God Master. Lord, thank you, Lord God Master. Lord, teach us, our God Master. Speak to us, our God Master. Lord, you are a teacher. Help us, Holy Spirit. Has a word say help come from you, God Master. Lord, we thank you and we praise you, God Master. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word, God Master. A wonderful word, Master. Yes, Father God. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Lord God Master. Lord, we worship you, we praise you, Master God. Ma. Yes, our Father God, help us, our God Master. Lord, make a way, our God Master. You are the way, our God Master. Yes, Father God. Lord, help us, Holy Spirit, for your kingdom and for your glory, God Master. Lord, thank you, Lord. Bless this man, our God Master. Bless our Master God. Bless all the pastors, our God Master. Those who are teaching us, our God Master. Yes, Lord Master. Thank you, Father. Bless them. Wonderful, our God Master. Yes, Lord. Let a mighty blessing, let a mighty glory come upon them and all the student, student us, our God Master. Yes, Lord. We thank and we praise you, Lord Master. Lord, bless, Lord, for this word, Master. Let all the student and, yes, Lord, they let all the student bless by your word, our God Master. Lord, we give you the glory and honor and praise, our God Master. To you, the to you, Lord, you take the glory and praise, our God Master. In Jesus' mighty and precious, precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Puja. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have thank a you, wonderful day.